Hello everyone, welcome back to Stream of Consciousness. I'm Adam Schmutter, your host. There's a rich history over the centuries of governments and militaries conducting surveillance on each other to better understand each other's plans, intentions, and capabilities. You don't have to look very far these days to find a report about another firm, many very well known in name, whose networks have been penetrated by cyber attack. The scope of this effort has become more sophisticated, creative, and as a consequence, all the more dangerous. The wild nature of these crimes are stunning. What is currently happening to the United States and around the world? With us is Dr. Faye Wolf, the founder and director of Your Eyes Digital Forensic Program. He has over 100 published articles in leading journals and has received over $10 million in research funding from agencies such as the National Institute of Justice, the National Science Foundation, and the Department of Homeland Security. He has been a professor at the University of Rhode Island for 16 years. Thank you very much for coming in, Dr. Faye Wolf. Uh, My pleasure. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. So let's touch upon your experiences with the University of Rhode Island and your research. Um, when did you begin and what got you interested? Well, my initial research was in um, distributed systems, which is computers connected to each other and, uh, you know, how that could be more efficient. And that was maybe the first 10 years, 8 to 10 years of my research career. Um, and at that point, I had become tenured, and so that's usually a turning point in a professor's research career to kind of look at where you want to go next. And about that same time, I went down to um, Washington, D.C., to visit my cousin, who had just opened up a computer forensics firm, and this is the late 1990s, um, early 2000s, I think it was probably 2000 actually. Um, she had opened up a computer forensics firm, and I, since I was a computer scientist, I thought, you know, I'd just go visit her and see what she's doing, just out of curiosity. She took me on a tour of what she was doing, um, showed me, oh yeah, we're working cases that involve digital evidence, and we're investigating senators and, you know, people around Washington. Uh, lawyers hire us to go in and, and find out what's, you know, if there's any digital evidence in the case. And while I'm sitting there talking to her, her husband, who was the tech person in the organization, runs in and goes, I got him, I got him, I got him. And he had found some evidence on a seized hard drive that had basically implicated a senator in a, in a, uh, in a financial thing. And I said, wow, this is really cool. And I said, I bet students at the University of Rhode Island would like this, particularly computer scientists. It's a, it's a chance to apply their technology outside of just software development, but in something that has kind of more social ramifications. So when I saw that, I said, you know what, this is going to be my new research career. So I came back and kind of stopped doing what I was doing and started doing that. Will you tell us a little bit about your current research and specifically what has made the URI Digital Forensics Program so successful? Um, I think we've had a number of reasons why we're successful. One is we were one of the first to do it, so we got in early. Um, I've also been very fortunate to surround myself with some very good people. Um, our program, our academic program is led by uh, Dan Dickerman. Dan is a special agent for the IRS and is one of the people who created the curriculum at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Facility in Digital Forensics. So he was one of the ones that trained a lot of the federal agents early. And he pointed us to a lot of the real research problems in the forensics area. The other thing that we had really good fortune in doing was very early on when the Rhode Island State Police st stood up their computer crimes unit, um, we got to know the people that were doing that and so we got involved with them and helped them build their lab. And in doing so, we saw the real problems that they were having in, in investigations. So based on the experience of Special Agent Dickerman and my interns and myself working with Rhode Island State Police, we saw real problems. And we were able to take those real problems and go to the Department of Justice go to the Department of Homeland Security and write grant proposals to get URI students involved with doing research to solve real problems. And that worked really well because they were problems that these agencies cared about, so research funding flowed to the university. The students loved it because they were working on real problems. So that's kind of how we got involved with, with what we did. That's terrific that URI is such a pioneer in digital forensic technology. Uh, thank you for promoting that and getting sure. that started. Uh, so. The basis of this program is research, and what uh, the format is going to be is we're going to discuss some 
uh, some current events and, okay. and some of those topics. Uh, so if you ever heard of dictionary.com, mm -hmm. uh, every year they select a word that best represents the current events of that year. Uh, so 2014, uh, they've chosen exposure. What does exposure mean to you, and why do you think that they chose that word? Uh, there could be a, a number of reasons, but I would guess that a lot of it has to do with um, essentially the, the topic of the URI Honors Colloquium this year, uh, which is you know privacy and security. And privacy is protecting things, and it's almost the antithesis of exposure, which is you know uh, putting things out there, and. We are seeing more and more instances of where exposure is kind of taking over, over privacy. Snowden's incident is the most common one that, that, that we've had several speakers in our honors colloquium talk about, where he exposed secrets inside the government. Um, both there were positive influences to that and there were negative influences to that. Um, another aspect might be more personal. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a perception that the current generation um, younger generations in particular, expose themselves more, their, their, their kind of personal who they are, more um, online than certainly my generation did. So it changes the way that, um, that those people are perceived uh, by each other and how they interact. So I think kind of exposure both in terms of um, more information is, is available. We're the information age. There's tons of information out there. That means that that information is exposed and you can find out more about people, about organizations. Uh, and I think it's changing the way that society works and that's been kind of the, the focus of the Honors Colloquium. So I think it's a great choice of words uh, from dictionary.com. Now I actually didn't look, did you say that the earlier was privacy? Yes. Okay, so they, they basically went from privacy one year to exposure the next. That is almost a perfect summary of what the URI Honors Colloquium is doing. We talk about privacy, and that's about can you keep your information, you know, that, that's important to you, private both from security point of view and from the point of view that people are taking it, but can you do that in an information age? And if you're not doing it, then you're exposed. And if you're exposed, what are the consequences of that? So I think that's a really interesting progression that they chose. Yeah, you, you mentioned a lot about generations. and. You know, starting going back all the way to the baby boomers, right, into Generation X, and, and now whatever they want to call my generation, uh, sometimes they call it Generation Y, the me generation, millennials, uh, and it's just the digital age. Uh, so, going back, how has it progressed and how has it gotten more complicated? It used to be that hacking, you'd have to do all these complex espionage tactics, but now it could just be done from the push of a button in an apartment building down the street. Well, it used to be the technology was relegated to um, very isolated areas run by highly technical people. Now technology is pervasive, it's everywhere. So, you know, a small mom and pop store might have a computer server in the back that the mom and pop's 15 year old son thought they could set up. And on that is important information to that business. That would never have been the case in my generation. The only people who had computers and were using them were big businesses and government and the military. Now, small businesses have computers, but they're probably not set up well and they're probably not set up in a, in a secure fashion. Um, everybody, almost everybody, has access to a computer. Um, elderly, kids, people who have never been trained in it use technology. That wasn't the case back in my generation. So because we're all using it and most of us aren't trained in how to use it right or how to use it in a secure fashion, whole new vulnerabilities have opened up because of the massive use of it. So how has the National Security Agency and the Department of Homeland Security uh, really provided service for URI and students? Well, the NSA, well, the, the NSA, the National Security Agency, and the uh, Department of Homeland Security, which I'll call DHS, um, are the two leading government agencies in charge of kind of securing cyberspace. NSA uh, was one of the original kind of people, like organizations looking at, at, at cyberspace. They've kind of more become now more about defense and offense. If the U U.S. has to have an offensive capability to cyber attack as part of a, a national strategy, that's the NSA now doing it. Um, 
Department of Homeland Security has actually, under a recent presidential charter, has now taken over as the lead agency for securing cyberspace in, our, in, 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 in the U.S. So together, they have formed, they've kind of come together, and they have formed um, initiatives to address the problems with cybersecurity. One of the main problems in cybersecurity, and this is something that's just great for URI students, is that there's a huge dearth in the workforce of people who can actually secure systems. So what the NSA, one of the ways that the NSA and the DHS have come together to address that is to encourage universities to get programs to train bright young people to go into cybersecurity. And so what they, what we, our interaction with them is that they have, they named us a, uh, a national center of academic excellence in both education and in research. They have two designations that we have them both. Very few universities have both. Um, what they do is they basically come in and they look at our academic curriculum. What do we teach in our courses? What kind of uh, students do we graduate? How many faculty do we have? And they use those criteria, and it's a very exhaustive process. They, they look very carefully to designate us as a center of academic excellence for education. And then they do a similar process in research. What kind of research projects have we had? What kind of publications? Have we given tools back to the community that actually help fight cybersecurity? So it's a long answer to your question, but that's one of our primary interactions with the National Security Agency and the DHS has been that they've come in and approved us as the center of excellence, which then opens it up, you know, students who really are interested in this can see that we have the seal of approval. It opens us it up for grant opportunities to get funding. So that's, it's a great thing that they've done because they've, as an organization, realized it's important for workforce development and research that an agency say what's important, and then they work with us to get our program up to their, their level of expectation. Well, hackers are portrayed in culture all the time, uh, and there's a movie that's just coming out uh, of actual, I believe, footage from the Edward Snowden experience. Uh, but taking it back, let's go back to 1995 with the film Hackers. Oh, yeah. um, I'm sure you've seen it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read an excerpt uh, from one of the main characters in that film. Okay. This is our world now. The world of the electron and the switch. The beauty of the bone. We exist without nationality, skin color, or religious bias. You wage wars, murder, cheat, lie to us, and try to make us believe it's for our own good. Yet we're the criminals. Yes, I am a criminal. My crime is that of curiosity. On another note, I personally think of Aristotle, who says that the pursuit of knowledge in itself is pleasurable. In that sense, it seems that hackers may hack for fun, and some may hack for a political agenda. Which do you believe is more dangerous? Um, it all depends. I mean, the, if you're hacking for a political agenda, and your political agenda is dangerous to people who have a different agenda, then I would say that that's, they would consider that to be more dangerous. It also depends on what the fun is. You know, it, if their idea of fun is something that's just a little bit disruptive, then there's probably not a lot of danger. It's more of an annoyance. But if their idea of fun, and you have to understand that a lot of the original hackers, and it's still pretty much prevalent in the hacker community, although there's all different kinds, but a lot of the original ones were somewhat antisocial. They were, they, they, they were striking out against things that were considered to be conventional. So, you know, oftentimes there would be a, uh, a feeling of accomplishment by how much disruption you could do just for fun. So their fun would come from disruption. For instance, you know, if, you write a vi if you're a hacker and you write a virus, um, your credentials among your friends could be how many people have you infected. And that, so that's fun, but it's a dangerous kind of fun because it's dangerous to society as a whole. So I think it depends on the political agenda that certainly um, if you're on the other side of the politics, then hacktivism, which is, the hack, which is hacking for political gain, that could be dangerous to that side. It could be advantageous to the side that, that they're trying, who's trying to make the point. But in, and the fun all depends on the degree. Um, if it's just a little bit of play, that you're going to take your friend's website and you know, change his name to yours, well, that's fun and probably not dangerous. But if you're creating computer viruses as a bragging rights to your friends and the virus takes out millions of people and, and, and millions of dollars worth of business, well, that can be dangerous. 
Well, it's very dangerous indeed. There's a recent report from the International Business Times that American enemies and terrorist groups, mainly ISIS, are using social media to recruit and disseminate propaganda. And the report actually says that ISIS is uploading images and tweets at a rate of 90 posts per minute. Now the United States has a team that are in the State Department who uh, they respond directly in some cases uh, to their tweets and even in a mocking way, exploiting Twitter to take on ISIS. Mm -hmm. Is that something that we've never seen before? Most wars, propaganda is a big part of war. You know, it, during World War II, they would fly, fly over and drop pamphlets down that would spread some kind of propaganda to get the uh, hearts and souls of the people that you're either fighting or trying to capture or trying to get on your side. So propaganda, I think, has been an important part of warfare probably forever. And this is the new form of propaganda. So instead of leaflets being dropped, you know, out of bombers over, over, over Germany, it's tweets uh, and, and combative stuff on Facebook pages. So I suspect that um, if military history has said that propaganda is an important part of warfare, I suspect that if this is the new form of propaganda, it will have some effectiveness. Speaking of which, uh, thousands, to the credit of Twitter and law enforcement, they have shut down uh, many of these accounts. Um, and there are 14 U.S. intelligence agencies uh, to date. Uh, recently, they released a public document uh, called NCIX, uh, which reported that every major company in the United States has been successfully penetrated by cyber espionage. This includes Home Depot, Target, and many others. And they did a survey of 90 different companies, and 70 of them had no idea that they were attacked. So this leads me to ask and really wonder, should American business owners consider themselves at war with an enemy that they don't know? And should they already consider themselves under attack by just existing? Yes, it's my short answer. Um, so I'll give you the longer answer. It's very, very easy for attackers to, to scan businesses of all different kinds to see if they have vulnerabilities, and almost all of them do. So it's, it's expected, and I'm not surprised by the statistic, that every major corporation has had a hack. I'm guessing that most smaller even and very small businesses have had as well. Um, so should they consider themselves under attack by existing? Yes, because if they're there, it's not hard for a, a, an attacker simply to run a scan and see if they have a vulnerability. For the longest time, there weren't that many hackers with the skill set, and they would only go after the really the big wins, you know, the, the, the targets or the Home Depots. But now it's so easy to do and so easy to do in a widespread fashion that they're looking for the low-hanging fruit. And the low-hanging fruit is often not the biggest corporations because they are the ones that can afford to hire the best security people to secure it. So instead of you know, spending years trying to get into one, one you know, fat, juicy target, they're going to spend a, a few days getting into many, many smaller ones and, and be, basically be able to accumulate similar wealth. So yes, I think that any business who, who, who thinks they're immune from cyber attacks is kidding themselves because eventually it's, it will happen. In your estimation, do you think that uh, the general public is aware of the threats? Not enough. Um, it's becoming more aware. I think the URI Honors Colloquium helps. Um, I think that the news articles now are and, 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 and media everywhere is coming out with, with talking about this. But I know when we first started um, cyber efforts in the state of Rhode Island, so one of the things that we started uh, probably six, eight years ago now, was the, it's called the Rhode Island Cyber Disruption Team. And it's an organization that was run by or led by Rhode Island Emergency Management. Um, it was run through the Rhode Island State Police. And they secured grant funding to basically secure the state of Rhode Island. Um, 
be able to respond to a cyber event in the state in a way that they might respond to a hurricane or something else. A team that could come back and if the critical infrastructure in the state, like water, power, were taken out by a cyber attack, how would the state respond? That was the, the main motivating force for putting together the cyber disruption team. And one of the first things they did was start campaigns to raise awareness because that was your question is, are we, is the public aware, aware enough? And the cyber disruption team at the time felt no, that that is really, really important. And one of the reasons is, we talk about this, in this hyper-connected um, society where we're all on the same internet and, and things are connected together, we're really only as strong as our weakest link. And so our weakest link mm -hmm. could be a janitor who brings their cell phone into a highly secured company and that phone has been infected and gets them in. So to combat that, that you're only as strong as your weakest link, you have to make more people aware that they have to have secure passwords on their phone, they have to have encryption on their phone. All the things that are important to secure your own personal self are actually part of the need to secure everything because we're all interconnected and we're really only as strong as our weakest link. I mean, every morning in China, thousands of highly trained computer engineers wake up with only one mission, and that is to steal American intellectual property. And the Chinese are against us and the international market and claim credit, and we've already lost billions on billions of dollars due to this. I mean, the problem, the way I see it, is the lack of a global understanding and acceptance for intellectual property. Uh, foreign laws and jurisdictions in other countries are different than the United States, of course. For example, in Russia and in China, their laws may prohibit hacking against the state themselves, but there's nothing in place to prevent them from going other places, especially the United States. And you know, I suppose it's in their best interest to sort of maintain that status quo. Do you know if this is being brought up in the United Nations at all? Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if it's been brought up in the United Nations per se. I actually haven't looked at that. But it's brought up all the time in diplomatic relations. So we, we just recently had some of the first public arrests of Chinese hackers under U.S. law. Mm -hmm. um, so. It, we know it, we, we've known it's been going on for a long period of time, but there are all kinds of policy and international relations issues that had to be worked out first because very typically, you know, when technology moves at such a rapid pace, the, the way most things are done is that you try and apply procedures and precedents and law to old precedent, things that were in, in place already. That's the way law has been created in cyberspace. And the, the problem is that the old precedents don't usually apply and they can't be kept up with. And that lawmakers have a really tough time understanding the technology and keeping up with the changes. It takes so long to make a law or to make a policy with a foreign country that by the time you had the law and the policy in place, technology has moved so quickly that the law is antiquated. So it's, just, it's very difficult to come up with policies and laws that can be used to address this mm -hmm. interaction with, with foreign nations. And you're absolutely right in that they have a different view of it. So if we come back and say, you shouldn't, China, you shouldn't be having a branch of your army dedicated to attacking us, that's violating some international treaty, they'll come back and say, no, it isn't, and, it, and, and their view of it is completely different than ours. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big problem in that we think of privacy and security much differently than mm -hmm. other parts of the world do. Yeah, and, and especially recent events. I mean, uh, just recently the NSA director uh, mentioned the Chinese hackers uh, and how they have probably already gotten into uh, the national grid and among everything, potentially. Mm -hmm. just a matter if they have the will to actually use it. Mm -hmm. um, and the Snowden revelations, those caused a pretty significant public stir regarding the way that the NSA collects and stores so-called metadata. Why is there a divide on the issue of collecting metadata? Uh, and, and what do you think about its role in the debate of privacy and security? 
Okay, well, it's collecting data and metadata, both. I mean, metadata means data about data, and the NSA actually collects data as well. Um, and it's, it's the trade-off, simplistically, and I think I'll say it very briefly because the entire URI Honors Colloquium, which is 12 talks over in a semester, is trying to investigate this in much more depth. Mm -hmm. But in general, the trade-off is it's privacy versus security, um, that you have... If you want to keep data private, okay, but it, it you're, you're going to be trading off like secu security on yourself. So, for instance, one of the you know they talk about uh, in the honors colloquium, one of the things they talked about was convenience. We're all used to convenience. So, a very trivial example is you click save my password, so you don't have to type your password in every time. You've chosen convenience, but now your password is stored somewhere where they can get it. Um, another example from the colloquium is the use of um, cards in, in grocery stores where they scan the card and give you a little discount, but now they're collecting information about you. So it's a trade-off between um, the convenience and the security of your stuff versus and your privacy. All of those things traded off, and it, it's, that's what basically it boils down to. So it's really almost a personal choice or a societal choice as to where we go with this. Um, am I okay with stop and shop knowing what groceries I buy for a discount? I personally am. Is everybody? No, they're not. So the, a lot of kind of personal morals and choices come in as well. And those are all things that society works through, but we're working through them right now. You know, uh, your generation is coming into, you know, adulthood now where you have to make a lot of these decisions at a time when all, everything's changing because of the hyperconnectivity and the technology. Um, so a lot of it's still being worked out as to where people, countries, uh, governments, businesses, where they put the line about how much they're allowed, they're going to give out in the hyperconnectivity to how much they keep private, how much convenience they get, how much security they get. It's all being worked out now kind of as we sit here and talk. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, looks like that's all the time we have for now. Okay. Uh, but I'd like to thank you for helping to coordinate the Honors Colloquium on Cybersecurity and Privacy. Uh, it's been riveting so far and uh, I've, been, I've loved the speakers and, and the audiences up here too as well. Uh, so uh, thank you very much also to our viewers at the University of Rhode Island and in the community uh, for tuning in. Uh, this is Stream of Consciousness. Uh, my name is Adam Schmuder and I'll see you next time.